Good villains are like seasoning. Without an engaging villain, a story feels bland. But saute up some egotistical monologuing, stir in a dash of tragic backstory, and top it all off with a flamboyant costume, and you've got a delicious dish. Anime is known for serving up gourmet villains. There's Gendo from Evangelion, Light from Death Note, Griffith from Berserk, Madara from Naruto, Vicious from Cowboy Bebop, Michael Jackson from Demon Slayer, and my personal favorite, Dio from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. There's not like one specific reason why he's my favorite, I just really like his his personality. I'm too sexy for my shirt, too sexy for my shirt, so sexy it hurts. <clears throat> Anyway, you might notice a pattern emerging. I have to agree with lyrical genius David Guetta when he asks, yeah, where are the girls at? Take a look at this ranker list titled The Greatest Anime Villains of All Time, which over 90,000 different people voted on. The top of the list is pretty male dominated. The first villain to appear on this list who is not a man is Orochimaru, who despite being referred to with he, him pronouns in the original Naruto series, was confirmed with Boruto to be canonically non-binary. <laughs> You know, that's some pretty impressive personal growth for someone who used to say stuff like this. You have to scroll down to number 25 on this list to find the first woman. Out of the top 100 villains on this list, three are non-binary or gender non-conforming, and 12 are women. Plus, if we consider the order that these villains are ranked on the list, women tend to be ranked lower than men. So not only are there fewer female villains, but they're also perceived by fans as being less interesting or of lower quality than male villains. If male villains are Michelin star cuisine, villainesses are more like Applebee's. To find the root of the problem, we're gonna have to strap on our aprons, ladies. We do belong in the kitchen. But not just any kitchen, the kitchen of evil. And for our first cooking lesson, we're gonna get spicy. The femme fatale, the sexy vixen who manipulates others around her using her feminine wiles, has been a trope in literature, film, and art for centuries. Ancient Greeks had femme fatales, like Circe, the goddess from the Odyssey who seduces Odysseus and transforms all his men into pigs. In the Far East, one of the most prominent real-life femme fatales was Daji, a concubine who lived in ancient China. Daji's beauty, greed, and cruelty are said to have led to the downfall of both the emperor and the entire Zhou dynasty. The stereotypical sexy siren is also pretty common in anime. If a show has a female villain, chances are she probably looks something like this. Let's have fun. Now the main problem area is up here. All of this going on up here is what's causing me the most physical discomfort. It's like a visceral reaction of discontent coming from this area. This area is not good either. I hate this, but I'm mainly worried about this. Now, I can probably guess what you're thinking. Do I really have the right to criticize fan service? I was just drooling over abs like 20 seconds ago. I promise I'm not going to complain about fan service today. My point's a little more nuanced than that. And to get to that point, I'm going to start with an analysis of one of anime's OG villainesses. Not just any villainess, she's one of the baddest bitches of all anime history. That's right, we're going to talk about Sailor Moon. Sailor Moon, a 90s anime based on the manga by Naoko Takeuchi, is the magical girl show of all time. I can't even begin to explain the cultural impact that Sailor Moon had on media made for girls in both Japan and America. Sailor Moon's first big bad was Beryl, the queen of the Dark Kingdom. She's hell-bent on world domination and leads her army of brainwashed soldiers against the peaceful Moon Kingdom, which is led by Princess Serenity. For those of you tragic folks out there who are not acquainted with Sailor Moon lore, Princess Serenity is later reincarnated into Usagi, the protagonist of Sailor Moon. But perhaps Queen Beryl's greatest sin of all is the fact that she goes after Princess Serenity's man, Prince Adimian. In fact, it's Beryl's unrequited love for the prince that drives her to become evil in the first place. Personally, I do not know why Queen Bee is so obsessed with the prince when she's got a hot single boy toy literally kneeling at her feet all the time, but I guess everyone has their type. You're forgetting your place. I did not tell you to speak. Well, this is awkward. I'm gonna let Dr. Catherine Hemmen, a lecturer in Japanese studies at the University of Pennsylvania, take it from here. 
In their article titled Short Skirts and Superpowers, The Evolution of the Beautiful Fighting Girl, Catherine explores the clashing ideals between the innocent flower Princess Serenity and the boss-ass bitch Queen Beryl. Dr. Hemond writes, While Princess Serenity rules passively, inspiring her subjects with friendliness and generosity, Queen Beryl is hungry for power and has seized control over Princess Serenity's moon kingdom through political machinations, deceit, and powerful magic. Unlike Sailor Moon, Queen Beryl is in no way girlish. She is a mature woman, and her full-bodied figure is wrapped in a seductively alluring dress. Her male general bows before her. It is Queen Beryl's lack of innocence that marks her as evil, just as much as her adult sexuality and aggressive wielding of political and military power. Sailor Moon is a shoujo, made specifically to appeal to a young female audience. And it's obvious that female viewers are meant to relate to and root for Princess Serenity. Serenity is a role model. She's the ideal heroine and the ideal girl. Passive, virtuous, and pure of heart. In the end, she saves the day and she gets the guy. Meanwhile, Queen Beryl is everything society says that girls shouldn't be. Ambitious, aggressive, authoritative, sexy, and jealous. And in the end, she gets immolated and sent to the Shadow Realm. <laughs> Sailor Moon suggests to its viewers that good, successful girls should stick to traditional gender norms. And girls who don't, well, they get what they deserve to be disliked by everybody, and worse, remain single. And you may be thinking, well, Sailor Moon's an older show. Modern anime doesn't do that anymore. Then allow me to present Exhibit B, My Hero Academia. Let's take a look at one of the show's heroines, Uraraka. She's the primary love interest of the show's male protagonist, Deku. She's a bubbly, cute, and friendly heroine. Her quirk, or her superpower, is the ability to make people or objects defy gravity. This power is useful, but it isn't very flashy or exciting, and she rarely stands out compared to Deku or the other characters who have quirks with a little more firepower. She's also a mind-numbingly boring character who gets little to no screen time until her romantic subplot with Deku becomes important in later seasons. Now let's look at Toga, a villainess. Toga basically exists to be Uraraka's arch nemesis. She's bloodthirsty, manipulative, duplicitous, and worst of all, she also has a crush on Deku. Her quirk is the ability to transform and disguise herself as another person, but there's a catch. She has to collect someone's blood to impersonate them. Oh, and she also has to be naked to use her quirk. You know, for anime reasons. She also does this thing where she makes this weird porn face every time she thinks about her looks at Deku. Stop it. Get some help. Friendly reminder that this character is 16 years old. Just like Serenity and Beryl, Uraraka and Toga are constantly pitted against each other, both in terms of the plot and their adherence to gender norms. Uraraka is the heroine role model who girls are supposed to relate to, and Toga is the creepy freakazoid who's trying way too hard to get noticed. This friction between gender roles and female villains is echoed by author Elise Ringo. In her article called Villainess is Required, Why the Dark Side Needs More Women, Elise writes, If women aren't good, nurturing, and pure, then they have to fall into other sexist tropes, the only other possible roles for a woman to fulfill. The model of a woman as dangerous seductress, or the woman who is bad at being a woman and so jealous of other women. In either case, their perceived badness is a result of either overperforming or underperforming this deeply entrenched femininity. I totally agree with Elise's point here. Both Princess Serenity and Uraraka perform their femininity perfectly. They're effortlessly beautiful without flaunting their sexuality, powerful but not power hungry. They're team players who provide support without being overly assertive or aggressive. Their kindness and compassion are highlighted as their best qualities. Meanwhile, Queen Beryl and Toga overperform their femininity. They brandish their sexuality as a weapon, covet men who don't belong to them, and their aggression and ambition are their defining character traits. When anime arranges its female characters into neat categories like this, there's not much room left for nuance or complexity. That might explain why anime's villainesses tend to be ranked lower than male villains. Because so many female villains fit the same stereotypical seductress, sexy mold, there just isn't as much variety in their personalities or their goals. So the fan service isn't the problem. In fact, the same Sailor Moon article I quoted earlier goes on to say that certain methods of presenting female characters as sexy or erotic can be a healthy way for creators and fans of shoujo to embrace and celebrate a sexuality that lies outside of stereotypes. Phew, okay chefs, it's a little too hot in here. It's time to make some side dishes. Most 
most male villains are in charge of their evil empires. They don't answer to anybody. In Demon Slayer, Daki works for Muzan. In Death Note, Miso works for Light. In Future Diary, Yuno works for Yuki. In Akame Ga Kill, Esdeath works for the Prime Minister. I could go on, but you get my point. Villainesses tend to lack agency in their stories. They don't get to call the shots. The poster child anime henchwoman is Conan from Naruto. She's a sidekick for another major antagonist, Nagato, aka Pain, and her backstory and motivation for being a villain are essentially secondary to his. This is even paralleled in their character designs. Conan's most interesting feature is the origami flower in her hair, which is a cute callback to her paper-based jutsus. Alternatively, Pain looks like the final boss in a video game where you fight increasingly edgier hot topic managers. While Pain takes center stage, Conan remains in the background. In the Akatsuki's meetings, Conan never speaks. It's true that she's acknowledged as a powerful shinobi, and she gets a couple of badass moments. However, her actions and decisions have little impact on the story. Despite being the only female member of the Akatsuki, who are arguably the most iconic Naruto villains ever, Conan ends up as one of the more forgettable villains on the show. It makes sense that her jutsu specialize in paper, because Girl is basically a cardboard cutout. I think that female villains getting stuck as henchwomen is once again a reflection of real-life gender norms. Specifically, it's rooted in the misogynistic idea that women are better suited to follow orders than give them. Leadership is for men, women get the coffee. We need to talk about your daughter. She's been getting home later and later these days. She's still only an 18-year-old girl, you know? Could you say something to her? I thought that was your responsibility. Hmm, the stocks. Grace N. Yi Ting, a Taiwanese-American queer feminist studies scholar and lecturer based in Hong Kong, writes, Manga and anime not only reflect existing models of gender and sexuality, but also reproduce or subvert them. Arguably, one's understanding of social realities, particularly the problem of sexism, in contemporary Japan must involve awareness of forms of imagination at work in anime and manga. But is modern day Japan really that sexist? To answer that question, first let's look at the 2023 Quality of Life Index. Basically, this list represents people's access to money, comfort, necessities, and material goods across different countries. If a country is ranked higher on the list, that's linked to a higher quality of life for its population. Japan is ranked at number 13 on the quality of life list. That's higher than the United States, which is sitting at number 16. It's also higher than China, Korea, Vietnam, and Thailand. Now let's look at the 2023 Global Gender Gap Index. The Gender Gap Index is a lot like the Standard of Living list, except it analyzes gender-based disparities. It looks at things like whether women have equal access to money, education, employment, and healthcare compared to men. Out of the 146 countries on the list, Japan ranked 125th. That's lower on the list than China, Korea, Vietnam, and Thailand. Even though all those countries are lower on the Standard of Living list, they're all higher than Japan when it comes to the gender gap. Oh, the United States is ranked at number 43, if you're curious. So why did Japan rank so low on the gender gap index? Although women in Japan are more likely to have access to money, education, and healthcare services compared to women in other countries, one of the primary reasons listed for this low rank was a lack of political empowerment. In the United States, 29% of Congress is women. As of late 2022, only 15% of Japan's diet are women. This BBC article explains that while there are now more women in the Japanese workforce than there used to be, women are far less likely to hold career track or management positions. As of 2022, only 8.2% of Japanese company presidents were women. And this problem isn't because Japanese women aren't interested in obtaining higher ranking positions. They're actively being pushed out of jobs in certain fields. In 2018, Tokyo Medical University purposefully altered women's exam scores so that a higher number of men could enroll instead. At the time of this scandal, only 30% of the school's students were women. Okay, so obviously we've taken a little detour. I'm not saying all this stuff because I want to dunk on Japan. I also didn't make this video with the intention of discussing politics or the role of misogyny in Japan. I didn't even make this video to dunk on anime villainesses. I love most of the villainesses I've criticized. My 14-year-old self wanted to be Conan, and my current self wants to get stepped on by Esdeath. This all started with a meme and a cooking metaphor, and to be honest, I've been playing that cooking metaphor pretty fast and loose up until now, but this is not what I initially intended. 
But the more research I did and the more that I learned about the barriers that women in modern day Japan face, the more I felt like I should talk about it. As an American anime fan, I thought I had an inkling of the type of sexism that existed in Japan, but I had no idea the extent of the problem until I actually bothered to look this stuff up. And once I looked it up, I was shocked at just how profoundly this issue is persisting today. But it doesn't have to persist forever. As a Westerner with no lived experience of what it's like to face misogyny in Japan, I'm certainly not qualified to preach about the best solution to Japan's gender inequality issues. I think one way to find a solution to the villainess problem would be to amplify women's voices within the anime industry. According to this article by Christy Gibbs, even though women create manga, work as anime artists, animators, writers, and voice actors at similar rates to men, there are far fewer female anime directors than male ones. For example, if you take a look at the upcoming winter 2024 season of anime, there are 8 shows directed by women and 41 shows directed by men. It's also true that many shoujo anime, which were based on works by female creators and marketed specifically to a female audience, have male directors. Here are some of the most iconic shoujo anime of all time, all of which were based on works created by women and all of which were directed by men. Adapting more manga created by women and giving them the opportunity to not only participate, but lead the industry could open up a whole new world of possibilities for creators and fans. Some extremely successful projects have been spearheaded by women. For instance, the critically acclaimed movie A Silent Voice was based on a manga created by Yoshitoko Oima, screenwritten by Reiko Yoshida, and directed by Naoko Yamada. Yamada is also known for her direction of K On, which won the Best TV Animation Award at the 2010 Tokyo International Anime Fair. As fans of anime, we can make an effort to support female creators by purchasing content created and directed by women. Anime studios are more likely to adapt these works and give them higher production budgets if they see that fans are willing to spend money on them. So far, I've been pretty focused on criticizing the ways that I think anime fails its female villains. But I also want to take a moment to praise a few villainesses who break free from stereotype and are presented as complex, dynamic characters. Some of my absolute favorite anime villainesses are Lady Iboshi from Princess Mononoke, Echidna from ReZero, Reiko from Parasite, and Isabella from The Promised Neverland. All of these villainesses are phenomenal, and you can tell that so much care and attention was put into their motives, their personalities, and their interactions with other characters on screen. They feel alive and real, rather than stereotyped carbon copies. Villainesses might not be good role models, but they can be good inspiration. Women can be good, we can be evil, and we can be anything and everything in between. Oh, and some of us can even be good cooks. Not me, but some of us. What are you? An idiot sandwich.